Good morning. It's good to see y'all this morning. Say good morning to someone else besides me. Oh, that's so fun. I just love doing that. All righty, welcome to Williams. Welcome any of you visitors. Um, we would love for any of you visitors to fill out um, the flappy sheet of paper in the back of your bulletin. It's the information sheet. We just want to get to know you better. So just fill that out and rip it out and put it in the offering plate in a few minutes. Now everyone, open your bulletins. Open them up. Get them open. Read along with me. All right, tonight we will have service in our CMC. Bob Ford will be here to lead the devotion. Mike is going to go and show his pictures uh, to the congregation at Pleasant Valley Baptist. Right. All right, so that's where he will be, and y'all can go visit there, or y'all can come and uh, party with us tonight and have uh, service with us. All right, um, there's some meetings going on. Right after the service, Mary needs to meet with any of the kids and their parents that are planning to do passport this summer. They need to discuss that. And also, since most of my youth parents will be there as well, I'm just going to meet with all my youth parents at the same time. So if you just have a kid that's, you know, 12th grade and younger, just meet up here in the front real quick because I have a sign-up sheet for fifth quarter this Friday night. Very important that we get some names on this list for some food. All righty. And then at 4 o'clock, we will have Raider Pride meeting, 4 o'clock. Um, let's see. What else is written in this bulletin? Fall Festival next Sunday night. Um, we need some candy and some prizes, but we need it um, next Sunday morning so we can get it all ready and prepared by um, the festival, by, by the time it begins. So that will be coming up next Sunday night. It's very exciting. Um, and then one last thing to let you know, that October 30th, uh, if you are not going on the zip line trip, you can be here at 7.30. We're going to have a church-wide uh, work day at 7.30. So write that down in your planners, on your calendars, and make sure you're a part of that. All righty. There's other things that you need to read about. Don't skip over it because I did. Okay, you've got a job to read it. It's important. Church directory, make sure you get your name on that list. All right, because I want to see those smiles I see on Sunday morning in the directory. Okay? All righty, so now... Find someone to hug, say good morning to, kiss them on the cheek, do whatever you want, go for it. Turn me in, in your Bibles to Luke 31, Luke 15, 31 through 32. Soon he said to him, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found.
good morning. It's just time to sing thy praises. Let's get your book. Hey, we can get that little red hymn book. Turn to hymn number 66, To God Be the Glory. Hymn number 66. We're going to stand. We'll sing the first and last stanzas. Join us, please. Thank you. We're going to sing the first, second, and fourth stanza. First, second, and fourth.
Second Timothy 13, 3 through 16, 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for repro reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that everyone who belongs to God may be proficient, equipped for every good work. You've got the time. It's a 40-day journey through the New Testament that is bringing together people of all ages in CBF. Partner churches across country, over 500 churches, have already participated in this walk through Scripture. That is a partnership with faith by hearing. In just 20 minutes a day, over a 40-day period, churches and individuals can listen through the entire New Testament. These audio Bibles are free and allow Scripture to reach people's hearts through their ears. Pray that people, people's lives will be changed. Pray for the churches who are participating that they will begin to share their love for Christ with others. Pray for the ministers who lead churches in this effort. How's everybody doing today? Good, good. Y'all go back to school tomorrow? Yeah, sorry. Did y'all have a good week? Off? Out of school? Okay, did y'all do some stuff that was fun? All right, good. I hope you had a good time. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the, some things that you guys do in church, and I want y'all to help me out a little bit, okay? So y'all can tell me some things that you do at church. Um, how many of you go to Sunday school? Would you raise your hand? All right. Do y'all have a book in Sunday school that y'all use for your book to learn your lessons? How many of you have a book in your cl class that your teacher gives you to look at? Okay, anybody ever color? Anybody ever color anything like that? You ever cut out anything, glue it, do any stuff like that? Anybody does that? Some of y'all? Okay. How many, how many of you have a teacher? I have teachers? Okay. Does it, the lights, do y'all turn the lights on when you go in there or leave them off? Maybe turn the lights on. Lights are on? Off? Not sure? Okay, good. We all meet upstairs? Your class is all upstairs? All of them upstairs? Okay, all right, good. Is it pretty nice in the room? Do y'all like it? Pretty good. Do y'all have Bibles? Do you bring Bibles? Or does somebody give you a Bible when you get there? So how many of you bring your Bibles? Okay, how many of them, somebody, teacher says, okay, here's some Bibles, y'all open those. How many of you do that? There's some Bibles in there? Okay, a few of y'all do that. All right, um, how many of you go to Bible school? How many of y'all went to Bible school this summer? Vacation Bible school here at the church. Good. Did y'all have fun? Is it good? How many of you went to the pumpkin patch thing, whatever, this week? Did some of y'all do that? Okay. Was it a maze, corn maze? What was it? Corn maze and a bunch of stuff. Okay, that's good. How many of you went to Passport Kids this summer? And did that. Wow, really? How many of y'all? How did y'all get there? Because I didn't get to go this time. I was gone. It's the first time I missed one. Van? Van? Who drove? Mr. Kirk? He's awesome, isn't he? And who? He's awesome, too. Okay, they're awesome, too, right? You better say that, Nick. Yeah, Sean's awesome. Okay, good. Did y'all have a good time with it? Um, let's see. Where do y'all sit in church, by the way? Do y'all sit on the floor, usually? Just in this part, right? Uh, where do y'all normally sit in church? In pe huh? Where? Cindy and back there. Okay. And that's, do y'all sit in different places? Because I have a hard time finding you. Okay, that's good. Do the lights, are they usually on or off during church? On? Okay. What about when it's cold outside? How does it feel in here to y'all? Pretty warm. Because what? Why is it? It's cold outside. Why is it warm in here, though? What do we got going on? Heat. Okay. What is hot outside? How does it feel in here? Cold. Cool. Okay. Pretty temperature good for y'all? You like it? Good. Can y'all hear Mr. Roy when he gets up there? Okay. If we had the microphone on, could you hear him even better? Yeah. Probably. He doesn't really need the microphone, but we have that. Savannah? Uh, Holly, when y'all read, y'all did a good job today. Thank you for doing that. Could y'all hear them when they read? Did you see what they did so you could hear them? That microphone, I don't need it that way, but they pulled it way down so they could hear. They could hear better, right? It was good, wasn't it? Okay. Um, Sunday night, y'all come to church Sunday night? I mean, you come to church Sunday night. Do you have a teacher? Have a book? Do y'all study the Bible? Huh? You have fun? Okay, how many of you like your church? Raise your hand. How many of you love your church? Raise your hand real loud. Good. Okay, what I want to tell you is, I'm glad y'all come to church. I love y'all. Y'all are awesome. 
Y'all make our church a lot of fun and a very special place to be. Thank you for coming to church. And one of the things I want you to know is all of this is possible. Your Sunday school, Bible school, uh, Sunday night, the Bibles you have, the lessons, the cutting out, the gluing, the trips you take, passport, all that stuff, because the people out here, they give money to support this church. It's very important that people give and support the church. Without people giving, we wouldn't have the lights and the warm when it's cold outside. We wouldn't have those trips. We wouldn't have those opportunities for y'all to learn about Jesus. So I want y'all to do something for me today, okay? I'd like for y'all to all stand up, and I want you to just look at some of these adults here, some of these people, and I want you to tell them a great big thank you for giving to our church, okay? Can y'all do it on three? You ready? One, two, three. Thank you. You all make a difference in our church, and y'all do too. Thank you. Y'all have a good day. <laughs> Heard to say it all my life. You're paying for your raising, big boy. Okay. I hope someday we have the time just to have a service, just to count our blessings. The only problem with that service, it'll probably go over an hour. We have so much to be thankful for, and God has been so good. You heard some of the stuff our children. We're going to sing our offertory hymn. It's 563. It's Count Your Many Blessings. We're going to sing all four stanzas. And as you're singing, you just sort of think along of how God has blessed you and all the blessings you have. 563.
Well, it's good to see some of the Hambys in the house today. We welcome you here. It's a very special day as all of us in this community will celebrate the 50th wedding anniversary for Peggy and Pascal. Where is Pascal, by the way? You tell him I ask about him today, all right? <laughs> Either he's in the nursery or he's resting up for a big day. We're very proud of the Hambys, and, and they are a very special couple who've ministered and worked in our church for a long time. And we appreciate their service and their uh, good Christian hearts. Looking forward to seeing all of you today. Thank you for coming to support them uh, today. Chris Barker is back there. Thank you, Chris, for being here. He's hiding in the very back of the church. Chris, we're glad you're here and uh, hope to get to talk to you for a few months after church today. Uh, let me just say one other quick thing. Next Sunday uh, is a very special Sunday from my perspective. Uh, we're going to have the communion service, and uh, I got everyone a gift in Israel that I'll be giving you uh, Sunday morning. I hope you'll all be here. Uh, Roy said, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have a service where we could talk about counting our blessings? Well, guess what? Next Sunday, uh, really what I envision that Sunday to be is just a day for us to, uh, as we get ready to have homecoming and enter into the Christmas season, is to say, uh, from my perspective, how glad, how glad I am to be a part of this community of faith, of this church. Uh, we've got a lot of good reasons to be happy. And uh, I want that day to be a day for us to put our arms around each other uh, and celebrate what's good about Williams, about being here, and what God continues to do among us. And we're going to share his table, uh, in his table, his cup and uh, his bread as a way to remember him and how much Jesus means to our lives and community. And I got you all a little uh, cup, a communion cup made of olive wood from Israel. Uh, I have an interesting story about how I got them out of Israel, uh, but they're here in a little bag I've been hiding away, so I'm looking forward to give those to you uh, next Sunday morning. I hope you'll all be here and tell the folks who were out on, on fall break uh, to be back as well. Today we finish up our series on the Ten Commandments from the book of Deuteronomy. I'll be reading from chapter 25 and 26 as we listen to the last commandment, which is about coveting the things that belong to our neighbors. So we begin in chapter 25, verse 13. There'll be two stories of how coveting hearts can get us in trouble. Here's the first. Verse 13, chapter 25, the book of Deuteronomy. You shall not have in your bag two kinds of weights, large and small. You shall not have in your houses two kinds of measures, large and small. You shall only have a full and honest weight. You shall have only a full and honest measure so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. For all who do such things, all who act dishonestly, are abhorrent to the Lord your God. Here's the second story. Remember what Amalek did to you on your journey out of Egypt, how he attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and struck down all those who lagged behind you. He did not fear God. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies on every hand in the land the Lord your God has given you as inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget to do it. And then chapter 26, a very positive story. When you've come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess as an inheritance and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from the land that your Lord your God is giving to you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to him, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give us. When the priest takes the basket from your hand and sets it down before the altar of the Lord your God, you shall make this response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my ancestor. He went down into Egypt and lived there as an alien, few in number, and there he became a great nation, mighty and populous. When the Egyptians treated us harshly and afflicted us by imposing hard labor on us, we cried to the Lord, the God of our ancestors. The Lord heard our voice and saw out our, our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying display of power and with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground that you, O Lord, have given to me. 
you shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. And this is God's word for us this morning. When I was little, I used to play a lot with my cousin Elizabeth. And I remember one day making a promise to Elizabeth. My mama made great oatmeal cookies, and she had made some, and I was telling Elizabeth about them, and she said, I wish I had some of those. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, I promise tomorrow when we go out to play, I'll bring you some cookies from mama's house. And she just sat there, and I thought, and she said, well? And I said, well, well what? And she said, well, you're supposed to st say, cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. That's pretty drastic, isn't it? And it was a way, as children, we would make sure to seal a promise because even back then, like it is today, we can't always tell exactly the intent of somebody's heart, even though they might promise to act or be a certain way toward us. Today, we're going to hear about the last of the Ten Commandments, our series we've been listening to from the book of Deuteronomy. And the commandment is, do not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. The application of this commandment in the book of Deuteronomy by these ancient people of Israel is to tell us stories about the intent of our heart. It's not really about what you've already done to get you in trouble or breaking the law. It's about an intent, a coveting attitude that exists in you that might lead you to act in a way that would hurt other people. It sounds like God, doesn't it? God in the Old Testament who says, I make my judgments about the kind of person you are, not by your outside appearance or activities, but by the intentions of your heart. God, the Bible says, looks on your heart and knows your inner self. Jesus is the same way in the New Testament. Jesus talks about being sure to keep our hearts clean because the motivation of our hearts, he says, is what really erupts into the outside of the way we treat people, whether good or are bad. So if we were going to go to Deuteronomy and we wanted a heart exam, Deuteronomy would say, well, here are two worst case scenarios for the intention of your heart. If you get coveting attitudes in your life, in your heart, here are two worst case scenarios, extremes, that could lead you to be something that would be pretty ugly to look at. So the danger in Deuteronomy for coveting is not so much about hurting our neighbor. The danger is what it turns us into if we covet what our neighbor has and we think we do not. The first case is about dishonesty. A dishonest person that comes to such a place that they begin to think it's okay to cheat their neighbors. The second case is about somebody who acts in a predatory way towards somebody who is weak and down and in their weakened state takes advantage of them. These are stories we know a lot about today, from the halls of Washington to Wall Street, predatory behavior that takes advantage of people who are in a low situation, dishonesty that thinks it's okay to cheat your neighbor for gain. When I told this story to the Tuesday Bible study group, they didn't talk about Wall Street or, or politicians in Washington. One of the ladies said, I remember a butcher who was dishonest when I was growing up. The butcher had a scale, and you would pay for the meat that you bought by the pound. And so this was not Lynn Edwards, by the way, or Tyler. <laughs> so I'm sure this is not going to be. But anyway, the guy would put the weight, the meat up on the scales and use his thumb to help the weight go down just a little bit because you were buying by the pound. So his roast weighed a lot more because his thumb was pretty heavy, if you get my meaning. In this story, the story says you shouldn't have two measures or two weights. They could look exactly the same, but one they knew weighed more than the other. So if they were buying or selling, when they put them on the scales, they'd put whatever you're buying there, and they put their weight there, and they could make it weigh what they wanted to weigh so they could cheat you in the value of what you were buying or selling to that person. It's like loaded dice. They look exactly like regular dice, but you could make them so that you could throw them and they would land on the numbers you want for your advantage. This passage says you shouldn't even possess stuff like that in the bag you carry around or in the house you live. In the second case, it's a story about the Israelites who were escaping slavery in Egypt and they had just gotten away from Pharaoh 
they were attacked by the Amalekites who took advantage of their weakened state. They had just gotten out. They had no defense system organized. They were weary from the journey. They had some who were lagging behind, and they were attacked. And the Bible says in Exodus, it was only by God's gracious act after the pleading of Moses that they were able to defeat their attackers. So here's what Deuteronomy says. If you have a coveting heart that gets you in the attentions of your heart and gets control of you, it could turn you into somebody that would might stoop so far as to be dishonest to your neighbors. Or it might turn you into a predator that would take advantage of people when they're at their lowest or weakest state in life. And Deuteronomy says, do not be that kind of person at all. These are extremes, aren't they? And extremes on the negative side of the way you and I can become if the coveting aspects of our heart become so important that we want what other, ha other people have. And it's just very simple. I've got toys and you got toys. But sometimes I think your toys are a lot better and I want your toys so much that I might stoop to the place where I would be dishonest and try to cheat you out of your toys or I might try to take advantage of you because I'm stronger than you and I might actually just take your toys. That turns me into something pretty ugly, doesn't it? I might begin to resent you because I think you've got better toys than I've got. Or it might make me into something that is completely opposite my normal character as a person. Deuteronomy says there's a remedy for a coveting heart. And it's very simple. Give some of your toys away. Be generous. Don't grasp them, hold on to them, and want more. Just let go of some of the stuff you have. The remedy of Deuteronomy is to be a generous giver. So the other side of this story here, from the two negative extremes, is a beautiful story of a farmer who was glad to live in the land, had finished his harvest and was very satisfied with his life. And he walks up in the front of the church and he, do, and he gives his offering, not quietly or secretly, by putting it in the offering plate as it goes by, but coming up in front of God and everybody and proclaiming to everybody, this is what I got and this is what I'm going to give to what I believe in, to the work of the Lord in my congregation. It reminds me a lot of a deacon I had in my church in Tennessee named Billy. Billy was a farmer, and he loved his church deeply. And periodically, if he ever felt the church was sort of having trouble financially, he'd go sell a cow, and he'd bring us a check. He called it tithing a cow, and he loved it. He was very proud of doing that. He was proud of giving, and he was proud of supporting his church that he believed in so much. This farmer in our story sells his cow, and he comes before the whole congregation, and he makes three confessions loud enough that everybody in the congregation can hear. This is what he says. He says, I have been blessed with the blessings that my ancestor Abraham was first promised for God, and I'm getting what God has promised to his people. I get to receive it today. And secondly, he says, I belong. When he tells the story, he says about the Egyptians, which didn't happen to him, but he says it like it did. They hurt us. They treated us harshly. They abused us, and we cried to God, and God rescued us. What he's saying is, I belong to a family of God, and that family of God belongs to me. I bear responsibility and identity to be a part of that family. And then the third thing he says is this. I sold a cow because God's blessed me. I'm in the land that God promised to give to me. I didn't earn it. God gave it to me. In fact, everything I have, God has given to me. I've worked hard, but without God's help, I would have nothing. And so I feel like I have been blessed. And out of the feeling of being blessed, I choose to help God continue blessing other people by extending the blessing, and I'm going to give some of the stuff that I have been given and pass on the blessing to others. It's beautiful, isn't it? It's a beautiful story of a simple farmer who goes up, and I can only imagine his pride and joy as he smiled his way back to take his seat in the pews of his congregation. This is what the Bible calls a cheerful giver. Now, let's be honest. 
a lot of us would cringe at the thought of an invitation that said, instead of us having ushers pass the plate, today we want you to walk up front and tell everybody what you're giving and drop it in a bucket here at the front of the church. Y'all all for that? We're not really for that, to be honest, because we believe that giving is private. Now, that's okay as far as it goes, but somehow we think that giving is so private, it's more private than almost anything else we talk about today. You know, sometimes I'm out in the community with people, and people will tell me stuff, and I'm thinking, man, I don't know if I'd shared that. I think I might have just kept that quiet. You hear about almost every part of what used to be the personal parts of a person's life. But I can guarantee you one thing I won't ever hear about. And that's what people give to the work of God in the world. People don't talk about that because they think it's private. It's almost like somebody to me that goes to their doctor. And they go to their doctor and say, I want a full physical checkup, doctor. Except now, I don't want you to check my cholesterol. And, and don't weigh me, and, and don't check my blood pressure. Other than that, you keep everything on the table and tell me how I'm doing, but that part's private. Now look, if you're going to follow God, and you want to lay your spiritual life before Him, why hide one of the most important parts of being a follower of God? What you give, your stewardship, how you serve. Maybe you should talk to your spouse about what you give and why. Maybe you should talk to your kids and your family. I was at a place recently and the guy said, you know what he did early on? He said, my daddy used to write the check to the church and he'd have us kids fill out the check. Somebody would write the numbers in, somebody would write it all out, somebody would date it, and then daddy would sign it. And he said from then on he learned how important it was as a family to make that decision to give to something they believed in. Part of giving is motivation, isn't it? It's motivation. And one of the best ways, I think, that you can be motivated to give is to get thankfulness in your life. Get covetous stuff out and get thankfulness stuff in. Now, a lot of people, when they look at their lives today, they look at what they have and they look and they see lack. There's a study by the Wall Street Journal, and they studied these people, and they said no matter how much people made, there would always be a percentage of people, no matter what they made, who felt like if they just made 30% more, I don't know why it was 30%, but 30% more, then they'd be okay. And they actually studied folks who got the 30% bump, and they still felt that they just had 30% more, they'd be okay. It's about what you want, and where can you be satisfied? If you give your leftovers to God and you give out of perceived lack in your life, you will never know that farmer's smile on your face. You will never know that farmer's joy in your heart. As far as I know, Jesus never asked us to give him a little bit of anything, did he? Jesus asked us to give ourselves completely or go home and wait while you're counting the cost of following Jesus. He asked us to take our cross, to give our lives, to give our all. Jesus never asked us for a little, and he never asked us for leftovers. One pastor in Atlanta was telling about hosting a group of Chinese ministers. And one of the things he did was to show them their food and clothes closet that they had at their church in Atlanta. And the, he was really proud of it in the ministry, so he took the Chinese pastors down there and they were looking at it. And the Chinese pastors only had one question after the whole visit. How come people are driving up to get help? And he said, well, you know, he's trying to explain this is America, you know, and it's not, it's, you got to get places and people have cars and they come up. The Chinese pastors never got it. They never got it. Listen, I know you may sit there today and think, I lack. But compared to most of the people in the world, most of the people who have ever lived in the world, you are the richest Christians who have ever lived. We have more than we think. Many people look at their lack. 
I'm simply prodding you a bit today to do what the song says. Count your many blessings and realize how much you have because as long as you look at the lack, you are in danger of coveting someone else's riches. As long as you look at the lack, you are in danger of losing a thankful heart. As long as you look at the lack, you will never be a cheerful giver because you will always resent giving something away to God. So instead of looking at your lack, can you look at your blessings? And can you be thankful? Can you give out of your own sense of blessedness? A speaker at a church one time said, we're going to do an offering. This is the way we want to do it. I want everybody to take your purses and your billfolds and hand it to the person behind you. <laughs> now we're going to take the offering. And is it easier to give somebody else's money or give yours? Yeah, it's a lot easier to do the other. When you feel like that's just not your money, you can give a lot of it away, can't you? And look, the Bible just teaches us this. It's not yours. That's a hard concept for Americans. It's a hard concept for me because I work hard for what I do, and I know you work hard for what you get. The concept of the Bible is different. The Bible says every breath you get is a gift from God. Every ounce of strength you have, every heartbeat, everything you have, the land is given to you by God so that you can be a steward of it in order to be a blessing to the world. That's the way the Bible sees it. I recently read a study that said there's only one-third of American churches today that are ahead financially from where they were in the last couple of years. Only one-third of churches. And I know it's the economy. It's a scary, rough time for a lot of people. Guess what? We're in that top one-third of churches. 25% ahead of our giving to our building fund than where we were last year. Thanks a lot to your response to our pledge campaign, and about 2 or 3% ahead of our giving financially to the regular church budget. Thank you for being such generous givers. This is another thing that they found in that study. That top one-third churches, the ones they studied, almost unanimously, a common characteristic that those churches had was a core value statement written, listed, that had something to do with what the church said they valued as generosity as part of their church. Guess what? We have a statement of core values. I hope you'll look at them periodically. We'll probably look at them again soon together. This is what one of our core values says. We value generosity as a principal characteristic of our commitment to God. I did not put that in there. That came from our vision team. And to be honest with you, it's not one I came up with. I didn't put down a template and say, hey, y'all, let's reword this. Somebody said, hey, we need generosity in there because when you think about Williams and they said, when we think about our church, that's one of the things we value. And if we come back in 100 years, even though all the people are different, we want to find the heart of the church still sort of the same, and we want to find generous people at Williams. And what your church has said when we all voted to accept that as one of our core values is that we say that that's one of the chief ways you can measure your commitment to God is the level of generosity in your life. And I want to say this as your pastor. From the very first time I stepped foot on this hallowed ground, I have admired your generosity. You are a generous people. You astound me a lot of times in the way you graciously give of yourself, your time, your stuff, and your money to what you believe in and to what I believe in is God's Word. I want to thank you for being generous. Now, I mean that. Thank you for being generous and giving. I'm amazed at how much food you prepare. I know that's not easy. Somebody was saying today, you know, we're going to have a fish fry, and you've got to prepare food for that. And the next Sunday, we've got another meal because it's homecoming. We're going to prepare for that. And I know some of you will say, man, that's rough. I don't want to do it. And you know what? There will be so much food there, we can invite five more churches and still have leftovers, couldn't we? It's amazing. Mary and I said that was one of the big things we did. We had a little checklist of when you go to a new church, what are we looking for? And one of them was they're going to share their food. <laughs> that was awesome. 
And you know what? Big check. Big check. That's awesome. You, you folks do showers and teas like nobody I've ever heard of. You don't confine showers and teas to folks who come to church all the time and are good standing members. Now, you do that, but you also give showers and teas to folks who are related somehow to a member. I mean, it could be by a thread they'd be related, and you'll give them a shower and a tea. And they'll walk out with two truckloads full of stuff. And you give it to folks who don't even come to church here much. Why do you do that? Because in your heart, God has, I think, created a generous people here at Williams. When I first came here, one of the first things y'all were talking to me about, how proud we are because we had just given several thousand dollars to build a church in the Ukraine. How many of y'all been to the Ukraine lately? I mean, it wasn't like we built something over there so we could go over and say, let's take pictures, man, look what we built. Y'all built it to a place that's way, way away. Probably none of us are ever going to go there. And people we've never really met. And there's some connection through Vic, but, I mean, y'all just sort of opened your... Somebody said, we got a need, and what did the church do? We're generous. And you almost just can't help yourself, can you? I love that about you. People, I guarantee you this, people, in Baptist circles at least, they know about you. They know about your generosity. You are well known as a generous leading church by example in giving. Reminds me a lot of Paul when he wrote in the New Testament about churches that could and churches that were hurting. And he talked about the church that could give and it says, your reputation of generosity precedes you and now I'm going to ask you for more because there is a church that has a need in the world. Our church shows its commitment to God and its individual members by our giving. We give over 10% of our money to missions. Now, I'll say this, and it's not knocking anybody, but I just want to say this. The guy that was a pastor of the church in Tennessee before I came is now going to be probably the director of the, uh, the North American Mission Board for the Southern Baptist Convention. The biggest church in Kentucky is where he's been pastoring. He went from our church to Illinois to there. And some folks in Alabama, the Alabama Baptist paper said, we're not sure we want this guy because his church gives a little less than 2%. They've got million-dollar budgets, millions of dollars, and they're giving less than 2%. And I, I'll be honest with you, and I don't know, maybe the Lord will tell me something different about this. I'm awfully proud of my church out here in Williams. Even though times sometimes are hard and we wonder, can we come up with it, we're plugging along and we're giving money away to people that we'll never see around the world to missions. We're a founding church for the McAfee School of Theology where four of our students have gone over the last several years. Michael Duncan, Dixie Scott Ford, Brandon Tubbs. Y'all heard him recently. Coming out of this church, why are they being called by God out of this church to be ministers for God's work? Our church was one of the founding churches, and we continued. There's some churches that said, we're going to start off because it's 1996, and we're going to help start this new group. And they start, and then they sort of quit. I don't know why. They just quit giving. We've continued to give all these years from 1996 to today, and we're giving to a school that started with 44 students and meeting in the basement of a library in Atlanta to now 215 students, all preparing for the ministry of God somewhere in the world. I'm proud of that. I'm proud when I walk on campus and there's a big wall of fame and it's got among some big, big time churches you know, First Baptist Church of Williams, Jacksonville, Alabama. You know, people all the time say, well, where in the world is your church? It's Williams, there's schools, Pleasant Valley, and it's the Jacksonville zip code. And it's a lot of explaining to do, but doggone, they know we're generous. I love that about us. I want to thank you because when you give to the church, you're helping people around the world in ways you can only imagine. I don't know what these people who are graduating from McAfee are doing. I don't know where they're serving. I believe they're serving God in some way, and they're talking to a congregation this Sunday morning, preaching the Word of God to them, and somebody's accepting Christ because of you. Somebody's life has changed because of you. Some church is stronger for the work of the kingdom because of you. Because of you, there are people around the world who are doing ministries, and they're helping in ways that you and I may never touch or see. You give to ministry, like Sam Bandela when he came here, the guy from India, and you get help some young women 
go out of a place where they would have been in poverty or prostitution by buying some sewing machines. So when they go to school, they learn how to sew, and if they graduate, they get a sewing machine, and they can make a living besides doing that other stuff in their lives. You also help some people in Macedonia have a kindergarten. Did you know that? By giving to your church. You've given and helped this, this place. They started it for the poorest of the poor in this place that I can't even pronounce in Macedonia. And they started a kindergarten for these kids. And these kids, to get to first grade, have to take a test. And if you can't pass a test, you can't go to first grade in Macedonia. And these kids are all passing the test. And they're going to first grade. And because they're poor, one of the things they found is they're healthier because at school, at kindergarten, they're getting a good meal today. Some, the missions director there said, somebody asked him, how can y'all have this thing? You know what her answer was? Because of generous Christians in the United States of America, they made this possible. That should be also listed this way. Because of generous Christians at the First Baptist Church of Williams, they helped make this possible. And some of you have given gifts that astound me just because you're doing something and then it just sort of happens. Like we went down to Katrina, and there was a guy that went with us, and he drove his truck down there. He didn't drive it back. You know why? Because his heart was opened by God to the need of somebody they probably will never see again, and he gave his truck. That came out of this church. A few weeks ago, I asked you about the possibility of supporting work around the world for the poorest of the poor, and I mentioned about digging water wells in the world. Somebody that week came up and said, here's a $6,000 check, and I want to do it. And we built together and through this family a well in Ethiopia that provides clean water for over 400 people in a village in Ethiopia in a place where 55 million people don't have access to clean water. That's an amazing thing. Your giving makes a difference in the work of God in this world, it makes a difference in people's lives. And it makes a difference here. I can't tell those stories as well because it's about you. And you'll get embarrassed and then you'll throw tomatoes at me or something. You'll get mad and say, you can't do that again. But there's a lot of lives here in this church and in this community. And people, you know their names. And they've been changed because of this church. Those children down here, they're not looking forward to going to school Monday. I said, do you love your church? you like coming here? They love coming to church. You, by giving, are making that possible. There's people here that I can name who have grown in their walk with Jesus Christ because you give and support the ministry and the staff and the work of this church. There's people here who have grown in ways that they say, I want to serve through my church and I want to serve better as a Christian where I work and where I go to school because of the ministry of this church. I've heard their stories. When I'm counseling young couples and they're fixing to get married and they've grown up through here in this church, I've heard their stories. They will have stronger marriages because of you. They're more committed because of you and your church. And when people are getting ready to pray to accept Jesus as their Savior, as a little boy did recently here in our church, that's because of you. It's because you give to support the ministries of this church. There's a widower who would gladly stand and say, thank you, thank you every day because you show him love and care a lot. Gary Upton would tell you that, and I'll name his name. When we're getting ready to talk about the funeral for his wife, Pat, who died of cancer early at 62, he kept telling me, and I didn't know about all this stuff because you just do it. He says, I just want to tell you how much I appreciate and tell the church thank you for supporting me praying for me, bringing me food, and taking care of us in a way that only a church can do. You got a story like that? I bet you do. Of a life that's been touched or changed because people give and support this church. Maybe it's your story. Maybe that's you. Your walk with Jesus is closer and deeper because of this church. Maybe it's your family. Y'all are closer as a family. You're closer to each other and to God because of this church. Maybe you feel like sometimes you're part of a God thing going on because of this church at Williams. And all that's possible because of your generosity to give and support something you believe in. I want to challenge you to give. According to Deuteronomy, it is the best thing you can do to keep the 10th commandment of God. I want to challenge you to give big. Give big to your church. 
Let go of it and give it gladly. Put a smile on your face. Have joy in your heart. You've given to God only what God has given you. And be generous in your giving. Because in my, for my money, we got more lives to touch in the name of Jesus in this community and around the world. There's more coming up and more to do as we follow the Lord. And I hope you'll give with pride. I do. I'm glad to give to my church. I give because I feel like the blessings God promised to Abraham, I get today. I feel those blessings. I give because I belong to a church family, and that family belongs to me. I feel identity to this place and responsibility for it. I give because God has blessed me, and I sure want to help God continue extending those blessings out to other people. We talked about Raider Pride a few weeks ago. We've been meeting, and one of the ideas was prom dresses. And one of the ladies said, you know, there's people out here that can't really afford prom dresses. And one of the things that's going to happen out of our church, there's going to be some girls that get prom dresses, and there are going to be sorority sisters that come out here, and they're going to fix them up, and they're going to be dolls. And I was telling some folks at Shaco this week where I went, churches in Birmingham, and the lady said, I got three prom dresses I'm going to give to you all. It's awesome. That all happens because of your generosity. I hope you'll give with pride. I want to thank you for being generous. And I want to thank you for what you have done and for what I believe you will do. And I want to thank you because as your pastor, I think I know the intent of your heart. You don't need to cross your heart. You don't need to do anything else. Just keep listening to Jesus. Keep doing what Jesus tells you to do. And keep it as a core value in your life that you'll be a generous person. Keep the 10th commandment of God. Just two weeks ago, a lady from out here came up to me at a ball game. And you probably wouldn't know her from Adam Southcat, But she said, I want to thank you for your church. Y'all provide a really good witness. And you make a difference in our kids' lives. Thank you for helping these folks out here at Pleasant Valley. That's a blessing to hear, isn't it? And that's because you are generous. Thank you, Williams. May God continue to bless us in order that we would be blessings to others. Amen. Thank you. Give us opportunity for you to respond in any way you feel the Lord is touching your heart and your life this morning. This is the last of the series on the Ten Commandments. They've been very challenging to me personally. I hope to all of us as we listen and hear the preference the Lord has in the commandments for us to have a better quality of life and the preference for God to use us and ask us to serve alongside each other in helping those who are more needy than we are. I love the Ten Commandments. I was really scared about preaching them, to be honest with you. That's big, heavy stuff to carry. But I've really enjoyed this. I think God has spoken to us all through it. I give you this opportunity this morning to respond if you need to. As we stand and sing, come forward, accept Christ if that's your decision. Come forward and join our church if you want to help us out. Come forward and recommit yourself to Jesus if that's what you need to do. I'm here for you. The church is as we stand and sing this morning. 366, I surrender all. y'all for being here. Let's prepare now for our benediction. I want to remind you uh, about the uh, afternoon's uh, activities with Pascal and Peggy, and also uh, tonight we will have service here. Uh, Bob Ford will be leading. If you'd like to come over and see the Israel slides again, I'm always eager to share them. Look forward to seeing you at Pleasant Valley. Either one. Thank you for being here today.
thank you for allowing me the honor and privilege of being able to be here. You've been good to me. You've been good to my family, most of all. We love your church. Something a little different this morning. It's not a pride thing. I just feel led to do this. Let's just give yourself a hand this morning, okay? Give yourself a hand. Come on, let's hear it. We just go to touch down. Praise and glory. God bless you. See you tonight. Hope to have a blessed day. God bless you.